Hello to everyone. Look, I'm just going to briefly set the scene. I need to take you back to 1961 when Brett and Wendy were living in London. It was their first big trip overseas and <clears throat> Brett was 22, prodigiously talented, the youngest artist to be collected by the Tate. Wendy was 20, um, the gorgeously glamorous um, partner and muse of Brett. It was an exciting time to be in London. Many Australian artists were there. Um, Arthur Boyd, Nolan, Michael Johnson. And Brett had become fascinated with the work of Francis Bacon, who was 30 years older and was very keen to meet him. And a friendly art gallery director arranged a meeting. And Brett and Bacon hit it off really well from that first meeting and became friends for the next 30 years. <coughs> Um, Brett, by the way, called Francis Franny. <laughs> um, but it was, it was a very much a friendship based on mutual respect as, as well as two lively characters. Um, Francis Bacon at the time was living in the famous Rhys Muse studio, the very cluttered studio in South Kensington. And Brett and Wendy were to visit there many times while they were living in London. And when they were no longer living in London, they would continue to visit... Francis Bacon over the next 30 years. Uh, coincidentally, Brett and Francis Bacon died the same year, which is 21 years ago. Um, Brett was 53 and Francis Bacon was 83. And just to also set it in context, when Brett and Wendy met Francis Bacon, he was about to start his relationship with George Dyer, who was the petty thief who handsome petty thief who famously died sitting on the toilet seat in Paris 10 years later and he was also the one of Francis Bacon's six lovers who he painted more than any other of his lovers and you'll see many of those paintings in the exhibition here. So Wendy, why was Brett so fascinated with Francis Bacon? Why did he particularly want to meet him? Um, well, the work mainly. Mm -hmm. um, we came out of Australia in 1960. Uh, we know, knew, very, knowing very little about Francis Bacon, probably nothing. In fact, I don't believe there were very many small books or big books about Francis Bacon available in Australia at the time. So he would have been, um, for Brett, a great discovery to start with. Plus he had a reputation for being a fascinating character. Um, Brett was you know, charismatic and mercurial and very curious about him as a person, but out of mostly out of absolute intrigue with the way that Francis um, tackled figuration, really, and his refusal to ever become or get close to um, uh, abstraction. He hated it. Francis hated it. Brett was moving through abstraction back into figuration, so they, it, you know, for him it was a very important connection that he was going to make with a senior and much revered artist. I remember Brett saying to me that Francis Bacon said to him about painting that the moment you know what you're painting, it's just another form of illustration. And he learnt from Francis Bacon the importance of using chance and accident and learning how to order an accident. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, Francis Bacon was a very, very well known to be a gambling addict, basically, and that kind of, in some senses, ruled his life. And then uh, there, a lot of the pictures, he does. He just takes a can of paint and throws the paint at it. But what people don't... Actually, Tony Bond said to me, he, he realised that Bacon knew exactly what he was doing. Now, that, you would think, would mean that he was controlling, absolutely controlling the chance element, which he wasn't, because if it didn't work, like losing a bet, he'd destroy the picture. So though it looks very chancy, and it's closely affiliated to the, to the way that when Brett subsequently, years later, worked when he got much closer to Asian calligraphy um, in the use of the big brushes and things. Um, they both admired the same kind of artists, of course, but that element of chance and the element of zen are very close together, that you can, you can work away for a long time. You do know, you have to know what you're doing. You technically have to know what you're doing. But if it doesn't work and you're not clear enough to destroy it, you know, to get rid of it, to not try and sell it at a gallery. So they had that element that they both, you know, had a kind of instinct for. So that was attractive to both of them. Um, and I think, 
You know, I mean, the, the friendship with Francis was intermittent because we lived in England for 10 years and it mm. continued. But um, every time we'd go back to visit London, Brett would look Francis up and, you know, they'd have chats, get a bit drunk or something. It wasn't a s sexual relationship. But they seemed to just get on really well. They seemed to like each other. And Brett, of course, was, as you pointed out, 50 years, 30 years younger mm. than Francis. But he, I think he liked his energy. Mm. And I think he liked the fact that um, he, he neither, he, he, well, he obviously liked the fact that Brett admired his work, but he, he, Brett wasn't sycophantic to anybody. So they could have a good, you know, cross discussion. With, uh, with each other, have a bit of a row and get over it, you know. It's a friendship, it's a proper friendship mm. that's based on a kind of mutual respect. Though, you know, Brett was very definitely the junior artist. When you were first in, in London, Brett was painting the bathroom series and that was, I understand, immediately compared to Francis Bacon's reclining female nudes. Was there any influence there? No, well, when you look at them, not so much, just in the, the, the manner of distortion. But I think with Brett, he was coming out of abstraction. Mm. And Brett, Brett Whiteley's abstractions, of course, are full of the human form anyway. This landscape and it's, it's the female form, usually the female form in the landscape, but it's abs heavily abstracted. So you, you, you have to see it. He drew that directly in his head from Lloyd Rees because he saw Lloyd Rees as being very sexual, those rolling hills and everything, breast forms and all that kind of stuff, which was, to Lloyd, a very intriguing idea because he'd never thought of them like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I always, I'm always quick to think, um, you know, growing up in Australia is very different to growing up in Europe where you, you're surrounded by great art from the past, which has got a lot of naughty things going on in it. Naughty, horrific, sexy things going on in it. So I've always thought that Australians, having not grown up with that, are a bit suspicious of people like Francis Bacon, because they just see horror. Do you know what I mean? They don't see that some of the greatest art in the world, or they see nudes as being something Auntie Maisie can't look at. You know, you can only have an or erotic art or something that can only be hung in the bedroom. That people are still very shocked by the things that Europeans who go to the great museums of the world take for granted. Okay, so it doesn't have a bit of Roman togary or Greek thingo tossed around it or it's not tied to a myth, but that's exactly what's going on. There's a lot of rape and murder and mayhem. Bacon attacked, obviously, the dark side of life and Brett was very, very uh, interested in duality and in, in the the capacity of the human spirit to be both good and evil, which is why he tackled the Christie subject, the Christie paintings, and in that you can see much more of a strong influence in the nudes um, to Bacon. But and Bacon drew his distortions a great deal from Picasso and the things that had happened before him too. Everybody has a, if they're honest, um, has an influence from somewhere, and and hopefully it's often from the people that they most revere. So that in the end, you're working against the people that you, you're working towards and against the people that you most revere, rather than settling for mm, good enough mediocrity. So you're always trying to strive to be as good as. And you know, I, I absolutely revere Francis Bacon. And I've spoken to a few people in this country that kind of say, oh no, they're too horrible. You know, oh no, or somebody actually, an art teacher, said to me that they well, how are they relevant to art today? And I was so shocked um, at that question that because um, he, he happened to think that Andy Warhol was much more relevant. But um, we were about to have a huge row. We were, at, we were at dinner, so we didn't proceed with that one. But it'd be quite interesting. I think he's very relevant and very modern and very contemporary. Certainly he's a painter rather than a installation maker or printmaker, and there are no drawings in the, in, in the Bacon show. Um, we, we're led to believe, and I've always believed, that he never made drawings. But uh, Janet will tell you about that if she feels like it. There's apparently some supposedly come to light. I mean, we should go back to Brett. Uh, why was Bacon so fascinated with Brett? And would you like he to tell the story? He just liked him. 
tell the story of the Rembrandt painting. Yeah, okay. Yes. Well, one yes. of the first shows that we saw, Brett and, and Fran, Ra, Francis exhibited and had done for some time at the gallery that took Brett on. Very luckily for him, it was at Marlborough Fine Art in London, and they actually kind of got bacon because they paid off his gambling debts in Monte Carlo, so they more or less had a contract with Francis. He had a particular minder at the gallery called Valerie Beston, and then Brett had an exhibition, and he, there was an amazing painting in Francis's exhibition called Landscape at Malabata, which is one of the only Bacons that doesn't have either an animal or a human form in it. It's just the landscape. Very dark, very moody. Are they showing you? Yeah. Right. And we got this, and then Brett had an exhibition, and he had the Rembrandt, which is still in the collection at the Whiteley Studio, and it's got an extended nose, so it was very oriented from pop and the Brett was working um, cutting holes in pictures and putting things inside them and it came to him to do the Rembrandt the old portrait of Rembrandt with this extended fiberglass nose well some people thought that was ridiculous and some people thought you know but Francis was very intrigued with it and so he took it home and we proposed to Marlborough at which stage they looked appalled that we do a swap with Francis. He would have done it probably because you know he wasn't all that interested in the in in more we're getting their fifty percent commission. Um, so <laughs> he may have done it, but anyway, it didn't come off. We were going to swap the landscape at Malabarta for the Rembrandt. However, Re Francis kept the Rembrandt, which he was did quite often. He actually was quite generous. He would buy painters, but God knows what happened to the paintings because he never hung them on his walls. He didn't have space. They just he either gave them back to the painters or gave them to somebody else. So he wasn't a collector in that sense, but he had a lot of money and he was quite generous with it. Um, so Brett never got paid for the Rembrandt and, and Francis kept it for quite some time and then said he'd used it as much as he needed to. And it's a, he's supposed to have said to Brett, you use me the same way I use Velasquez. Well... I can't quite figure that, except that they were useful to each other through history, you know. When you look at Whiteley's and you look at Bacon's, in many ways they're not very similar. But there is that, the capacity to distort the body. You know, Picasso's distortions in, in far as portraits are concerned was often, you know, people often thought was based on vengeance, if he was pissed off with the women in his life. They may think that about the bacon things, and he didn't. He didn't have sitters in front of him, and Brett didn't work with sitters either. He worked from photography or thing. But uh, you know, no one says you're a model for something. It's not. It's not. Um, you actually model. Francis never used a model very much. It just, you know, in the sense he had photographs of the models, or he'd work from photography, and Brett often did the same thing. So they had similar ways of working. Similar ways, they like to, to have a bit of a, you know, get a bit pissed, a bit drunk. Brett didn't spend much time at the colony room because it was practically um, faded away by the time we got there. But he'd go to the studio and visit it, and, and he took a friend of ours to the studio once who wasn't allowed into the working... Brett used to go into the actual working space, which was quite rare, to have a drink with Francis, but the this woman friend was left standing on the outside, and the only time I went there, I went into the sitting room. The, the, the studio, well, you see all the photographs of the reconstruction in Dublin, was tiny, was minute. And it was always very intriguing as to how he, how he painted those big triptychs. And the working on, on triptychs was another thing that Brett took up, by working on separate panels that you could work on one at a time but join together and twist around in different shapes and things. And Whiteley's, of course, you know, there's alchemy in the American dream and the big thing that's out at Hazelhurst at the moment the beach thing, well, the idea is that you can either turn them in circles or twist them in like big Japanese screens or like the predellas on, on um, the big paintings in churches that we used to go and look at in Siena, the Leducios and things. They're all in museums now and out of the churches. But um, Francis always said that he'd never seen the Velasquez, the Pope, that he, he'd never looked at it. He was too afraid. He just looked at photographs in books. Whether that was really true, I don't know. But it's a fascinating idea that he was so kind of terrified of seeing it in reality that it would overwhelm him, that he only looked at it in photographs. I think that's very kind of strange, don't you? Yes, I do. I was going to mention that um, we should say that Brett did two series of 
portraits of Francis. The first one, the, the silk screen paintings in 1971 and then in 84, the portraits. You might like to talk about those. Well, um, in 96... What was the date? 71, on the first one. 71. But he made yeah. a thing called the straight head of Franny, which was turned into a silk screen. It's a calligraphic drawing. And then he took the screen and moved it for each piece. So there's 26 works, which was put into a box with a photograph of Francis, a head of Francis Bacon on the cover, um, which is called Endlessism, which is what Brett then called the, the company, the, the company that the tax lawyer said we should become. It was called Endlessnessism. And the judge in the divorce court called it Endless Narcissism, which Brett didn't think was very funny at all. But <laughs> I thought it was hysterical at the time. <laughs> and I'm sure Francis would have laughed as well. <laughs> um, however, he made these things. And they're, they're amazing because he's, he's used the screen to move the thing and then drawn on top of the screen. So each one is a unique work. And that's currently we've put on display at the Whiteley Studio for the for the rotating bus that's going to go. Somebody's going to tell you at the end when that's happening, but there's a kind of bus that's going to go to the studio for you to look. And at another time, he actually went to um, Rees Muse to paint a little oil head of Francis, um, and he posed for that. And the photographs for that are, are, are actually of Brett painting Francis in Francis Studio. It's a small work. And then just before he died, he, he made a big um, Francis Bacon portrait to stick in the Archibald, but I don't think he put it in the Archibald. I think he put it kind of to one side. Um, from memory, he told Edmund Capon he didn't want it in the Archibald because he didn't want to win the prize. <laughs> <laughs> Again. <laughs> that sounds rather vain, but anyway, he did hang it. Uh, that subsequently was sold, so, you know, that one's gone the way of looking after the Brett Whiteley studio. Um, that's all. What else? Um, oh, I can tell you a couple of, you know, kind of anecdotes about one time we were in London and Brett and Joel Ellenberg were there just before I went. They were in London just before me and I arrived. Joel Ellenberg, who was at that time one of Brett's best mates and it was becoming a sculptor and working in Carrara. He's died at 32 too. But they were, they'd rented bikes and they were pedalling down the street and they found Francis sitting in the gutter and had to rescue me. Oh, Brett, I've just been sick, he said. <laughs> and took him home. He was a heavy drinker, binge drinker, and a masochist, and a homosexual, and had had a difficult childhood, an atheist, fascinating mind. I was terrified the first meeting we had. We had dinner at the Café Royale set up by Brian Robertson at Brett's request. Um, <laughs> who was a good friend of Francis. Francis got on with him anyway. Um, and I was terrified because I'd heard how awful he could be if he wanted to be. You know, he could just go from being very charming and snap and go to being absolutely hideous. Um, the next one would be really nasty. But uh, however, we had a very charming evening. And the only times I ever, you know, went to anything with Francis dinners or anything is he was always great. So I was lucky enough to escape the acerbic thing, and, and, I, and he was never cross with Brett. So it was the kind of nice, warm thing. And for Brett was very proud of his relationship with Francis because he admired him so much as an artist and was intrigued with him as a man. So, you know, it was a really enduring friendship. You and it's odd that they died in the same year, really. Yeah. You, you mentioned you also remember a few occasions of, of Francis behaving badly at, at grand openings. Mm. He was famous for that. He, he, loathed the, he loathed authority and he loathed the royal family and he loathed all kinds of things about England, um, you know, the kind of middle class ethics and things at the time. You forget that a lot of the stuff he was getting up to at that time was illegal. It was illegal to be homosexual. It was um, frowned upon to like rough trade. But people like David Hockney left England, you know, a few years later because of those laws. So it wasn't all that extraordinary and it's taken some time to change it. He felt kind of Irish, so he wasn't really Irish. Had a difficult relationship with his parents and so he had this attitude which was, I suppose it was closer to anarchy than anything. 
and there was one evening when Princess Margaret was singing ditties at an opening and he called out from the back that she shouldn't give up a day job and <laughs> walked out. So, you know, he was famous for things like that and people rather quaked at having Francis at Bacon or Francis Bacon opening. And, of course, the famous one where, George, where he'd heard that George Dyer had committed suicide when he was in Paris. And another time when we were in New York, something happened back in London. It was the only time he ever went to New York for an exhibition at the Marlborough Gerson Gallery in New York. He, lo he didn't like America. Well, he, he didn't like American painting more than he didn't like America. And he said he didn't like America. But it, there, there was a phone call and a very odd exit. In he was mercurial. Therefore, fascinating. You know, um, fascinating man. The, with that weird, strange face, you know, that kind of looks like an owl sometimes. With those great extended jowls and things like that. He'd been very good looking as a young man, but he was very odd looking as an older man. You know, really odd with his weird. I never really saw him with a, in drag, in makeup, with his fishnet stockings. I never. He might have had them on underneath his trousers, but I never saw that. <laughs> Patrick White and, and, and of course, um, Roy de Mace would have known him more in that scene than Brett ever did. And the colony room had kind of died. It was just a museum piece. But it was a lovely warm relationship. It had a huge influence on Brett. And, of course, Francis had more influence on Brett than Brett had on Francis, but they had a good relationship. Bacon didn't really change what he did all that much. Once he started to paint in his 30s, wasn't it? He, um, he was a late starter as far as painting was concerned. Um, he never really changed that much. You know, they got softer as he got older and a lot of people say, like they say about a lot of artists, that they've lost their virility and they're too soft or they're too colourful that they'd rather. But the English didn't buy his pictures all that much when we were there. The Americans and the Germans did, but not the English. So the fact that they've now become monumentally expensive, so, you know, 80, 80, 80, 88 million some bacon went for just recently. So they've, you know, increased in pressing. I hope you all go and look at the show, and I hope, you know, you really kind of um, look to see that it's not about horror. It's just about the human spirit, the human psyche. The, I think they're, they're, they are, of contemporary painting, they're one of the most sophisticated works that you could possibly be seeing. And we're bloody lucky to have this show here. And I, you know, I think big round of applause for Tony Bond for working so hard to get it here. thinking of one when, when you might have some more memories of what it was like to visit Reese Mews going up that s staircase with a greasy rope on the side. Yeah, well, it, it, it was perfectly obvious it wasn't going to be possible to open it as a public museum. Like, Brett's studio was kind of ready-made in a way, apart from the fact it's in a very narrow laneway and there's no parking. But Reese Mews literally was a one person at a time up the stairs. And then when she got up the stairs, it was... All he could do was look into the studio. It was so packed jam with stuff. So the idea of dismantling it, which was an extraordinary thing to do, I mean, it was fascinating. Mm. I could never work out how the hell he got the... Because they were big triptychs that he used to do, but he could only do one at a time. So Francis never actually saw those big triptychs until they were, had come from the framers, framed up. Never saw them up together, because there was nowhere in the studio that he could put them up together. So he had a very good strong idea in his head about where he wanted things to stop and start, you know, in, as far as triptychs are concerned. And that thing of glazing them and framing them, and that, Brett, that had a big influence on, on Brett, putting glass and, and gold frames on his pictures. Um, he really liked that reflective thing too. A lot of people hate it. But, um, no, it's fascinating. There's no, there's no way that you could not think Francis Bacon in one's lifetime, one was very, you know, it was an amazing thing to meet him. And you met, you met both George Dyer and his Brief subsequent George replacement, Dyer, um, yeah. John Edwards. John Edwards we yes. knew much better. Yes. Do you have any particular memories of them? No, just that he was a very charming, you know, yeah. good-looking tall bloke who, who um, though he was illiterate, was, wanted to be a photographer and took some great photographs. Mm. And Francis seemed to be very fond of him.
you know, for a long time. Though, as you point out, he hardly saw him at the end of his life. Mm. And it kind of moved on in other directions. I think Francis was quite a loner, really. You know, he's one of those odd creatures that there's only so much room in their lives apart from their work for, for other people. And he didn't have a wife or children or any of that, so... And he never lived with any of his lovers. They never, they, he always right. had a separate apartment for them. There was no room for them to live in Reese Mews. He never wanted the domesticity thing. No. no. No, no, I don't think so. No. There's a lot of people like that, though, isn't there, if they were honest? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. You've been very gorgeous.